The following program is brought to you by Podcast One Sportsnet. And caller number nine for $1 million. Rita, complete this quote. Life is like a box of... Uh, Rita, you're cutting out. We need your answer. Life is like a box of chocolate. Oh, sorry. That's not what we were looking for. On to caller number 10. Oh, Bad network got you glitched out of luck? Switch to Boost Mobile's super reliable, super fast nationwide network and get four lines, each with unlimited gigs, for just $100 a month. Plus, get four free phones. Boost makes it easy to switch. Switching makes it easy to save. Coming at you this fall, the iconic series Magnum P.I. is being rebooted for a new era. Premiering Monday, September 24th, after the season premieres of The Big Bang Theory and Young Sheldon on CBS. The show takes place on the beautiful shores of Oahu at the legendary estate of Robin Masters. Heading up the cast is Jay Hernandez, who has all the Thomas Magnum swagger and charm you love. Joining Jay, we've got Perdita Weeks, the Higgins for a new generation. Juliet Higgins as the ex-MI6 agent with some kick-ass moves. Stephen Hill as TC, Magnum's chopper at the ready. And Zachary Knighton as Rick Wright, the guy who always has a guy to get whatever you need. The action-packed series premiere is directed by Justin Lin, known for bringing high-octane excitement with The Fast and the Furious. Go to cbs.com slash show slash magnum dash pi or jump over to facebook.com slash magnum pi cbs to see interviews, trailers, and behind-the-scenes clips. The following program is a podcast1.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the mean streets of Los Angeles, California today. I'm sitting here at 317 Gimmick Street, about to open up a can of audio whoop-ass extraordinaire with a young professional wrestler on the independent scene by the name of Maxwell Jacob Friedman. You might know him as MJF. This dude has been in the business for about three years. He's 22 years old and is already working at an extremely high level. Now, he does have a few tricks of the trade to learn, as we always do. No one ever goes to the ring and says, I know it all. But this is a guy with a lot of potential. It will be interesting to see where life takes him, where his career takes him. But he has a lot of the tools necessary to make it to the very top. It's a very interesting conversation. I had a lot of fun talking to this young man. Came through Los Angeles working a shot, and he's working all over the United States of America. He's in high demand. Been doing some work for basically every independent scene out there. Been doing some work with MLW, my buddy Court Bauer. And uh, I tell you what, he is a heat-seeking missile. Normally, he likes to work the arm. Arm submission is his finish. He's a heat-seeking missile. Loves to work for the heat. Can build to a real hot finish at the end of the match. And I tell you what, he's uh, he's a breath of fresh air. He is somewhat arrogant. Dare I say, he's very arrogant. He's very full of himself, and he's very cocky. Very confident. Nonetheless, you have to have those traits if you want to succeed in a very tough business, the business of pro wrestling. And I tell you what, man, this guy can work a crowd like it's nobody's business. Fun conversation. We're going to get to him in a minute. Before we get to him, I want to go back to my Saturday. What a great weekend it was for college football, man. Uh, My alma mater, the University of North Texas Back in the day, when I played football for them, it was North Texas State University. Man, I think they went down to Arkansas and opened up a big-ass can of whoop-ass on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Arkansas is in the Southeastern Conference. In my opinion, the toughest conference in college football. North Texas went down there, and amongst the many things they did was a fake punt. Fooled the entire team, probably entire stadium, and God dang, what a damn play that was. But anyway, i got to give a shout-out to the Mean Green over in North Texas. Coach Seth Luttrell really has that program going in the right direction. I go way back to my days of playing there, and I believe I was there in 1986 and 87. And in 86, I blew out my ACL on a kickoff coverage. I was a number two linebacker. In 87, I was a starting defensive end at the weak side across from Tom Meadow on the strong side. And we got our asses kicked damn near every single Saturday. I think we won two games one year and three games the next. I tried to look up our results uh, from you know the record books back in the day on the computer, but they didn't go back that far or I couldn't find them. I couldn't even find a roster with my name on it. 
but I was down there on a full scholarship. And back then, we were a Division II school. Nowadays, they're a Division I school and operating at a real high level. I've been uh, in communication with uh, the coach and the athletic director down there, and I talk to them on uh, Twitter every now and then with some direct messages, and I'm really proud that they got things going in the right direction. And hopefully, we, as we all know, it's very, very early in the season. It's a long season to go. But nonetheless, man, it's good to see them on the right track down there in the great town of Denton, Texas, where I lived for a couple of years and entered into the business of professional wrestling with world-class championship wrestling right when it was being bought out uh, by Jerry Jarrett from Chris Von Erich to turn in to the United States Wrestling Association. So, man, lots of memories down there for me. And, man, right across uh, the state over in Austin, Texas, where I was born and raised for about three years, Texas Longhorns with Tom Herman coming out of the gate. Man, I think they were one and one going into uh, this big game with uh, University of Southern California, the Trojans. Started off as a real close game, a real tough game, as it always is. And I remember back in the day, I guess what was it, a few years ago when Vince Young was a quarterback, and it was the Rose Bowl. And Vince Young, damn near, I mean, it, it was a total team effort, but Jesus Christ, what a platform for Vince Young just to just show how much of a badass he was in college football. Just what a total beast. He was running all over the place, making plays, throwing a football. And they came out of there with just a, by the skin of their teeth, with a big-ass win over Southern California. So, man, for the Texas to get back on the right track, Tom Herman, second year in that program. Uh, hopefully they get it turned around. If anybody can do it, they can. And being the University of Texas at Austin, you know, at the cream of the crop as far as, you know, a destination place for a college football player to go. So we'll see what happens there. And then, man, over there at Texas A&M, where my niece and my nephew are at, Neil and Emma, man, they're going to go down to Roll Tide this coming Saturday. So I'm looking forward to that game. Texas A&M down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Everybody knows I'm a big Roll Tide fan. I'm going to see. I'm going to probably have to place a bet. I'm not a betting man. But I might have to bet my niece and my nephew a little bit of something on that game because they are diehard Aggies fans. And every time I text them or talk to them on my Instagram account, I I put on there, go Aggies, because I misspelled Aggies. That's the thing in Texas. You're always making fun of the Aggies. But it's an outstanding school. It's an engineer school. But the thing is, you always make fun of the Aggies. But uh, they are so happy and proud to be down there. And I'm so proud proud of them for making it into that wonderful university, but they're going up to uh, Alabama's, uh, it's going to be a hostile environment, as is Kyle Field when when opponents come to play at Texas A&M, it's a hostile environment so we'll see how that game goes over but I'm looking forward to it and uh, a lot of games, man, Nebraska, god dang it, got blowed out, man, a couple of people got blowed out this uh, weekend, but uh, it was a great week of college football, I got a chance to just hang around the crib and check it all out, but anyway, I'm I'm running my mouth, I want to get to this conversation with uh, Maxwell Jacob Friedman. And this guy, uh, towards the end of podcast, things uh, kind of take a left or a right, whatever you want to call it. But be that as it may, uh, this guy has all the potential in the world. Like I said, he's still got work to do, but he's uh, he's working at a real high level. And uh, we'll, we'll see where his career takes him. I think you're going to enjoy this podcast a, a whole lot. And I hope you do, because I had a tremendous time talking to this young man. But before we get to a big-ass can of audio whoop-ass with MJF, keep in mind that while I'm here flapping my gums, there's millions of skilled workers out there, construction workers or utility repairmen, who make their living as doers. They keep the lights on, the roads paved, the water flowing. They're unsung heroes who keep the world moving. In fact, this podcast might not even exist or get to your ears without skilled workers to provide the electricity and bandwidth for your laptops and devices. For all the doers out there, Timberland Pro has a stud wall quarter zip pullover designed to keep you comfortable, warm, and dry. This pullover features a durable water repellent finish, a stand-up collar and chin guard so your zipper doesn't rub against your skin, stretch side panels for added mobility, rugged textured polyester bonded fleece. The stud wall quarter zip pullover is a must-have wardrobe staple for the hardworking doers out there. There are talkers and there are doers. Timberland Pro. Always do. Never done. 
Football season is here, and no one covers football like Podcast One Sportsnet. We've got you covered on a daily basis with Dan Patrick, Rich Eisen. This might be just a walk in the park. RJ Bell's Dream Preview and Ross Tucker's Fantasy Feast Podcast. They're just creating more work for me at this point. We also have Jim Harbaugh with Attack Each Day and Revenge of the Jocks with Martellus Bennett. Football is the ultimate soap opera. So download all of these shows and more each week on PodcastOneSports.com. This is the Steve Austin Show. All right, rolling sound over here at 317 Gimmick Street. Maxwell Jacob Friedman just rolled in. How's the road treating you? I mean, it's treating me great. Steve, great intro. Do you mind if I give one, just real quick? I'd love for you to give me one of your trademark intros. Phenomenal. Mike is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, just in case you're deaf, dumb, blind, stupid, or let's just assume poor, no offense, my name is Maxwell Jacob Friedman, and I am the youngest and fastest rising star in professional wrestling today, and I'm better than you, and you know it. How's it going, Steve? Great to be here. Man, it's going good. I got a... This, this interview is going to be all over the place. We've been shooting the breeze about the wrestling business for about 30 minutes. And finally, I looked <laughs> over at MJF and said, dude, we got to hit the red button. We're talking about too much good shit. Now, you can probably keep things as you will today. Sure. I'm fine with that. But i gotta, I got to give you a shout out. Uh, my wife and I go down to Napa Valley every now and then. We just got back a few weeks ago. And, dude, you big spender, you deep pockets. I got a bottle of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars Artemis Cabernet Sauvignon from 2015 from MJ. You talk about a high-class, high-profile cat. Much appreciated. Hey, I don't mess around, man. Okay, I go wine tasting pretty much every single weekend, and I figured only the best for Stone Cold. Dude, you could have went out and bought me some two-buck chuck, and I'd been happy. But the fact that you had the class, the wherewithal, and taste, and the deep pockets to buy me this bottle of Artemis says a lot about you to me. How's the road treating you? Um, it's treating me great, better than most. Um, I'm pretty much making my rounds coast to coast, across the border, across the pond, working for pretty much damn near every single top promotion in the world. Where'd you grow up? New I, York or New Jersey? I grew up in uh, New York. I don't come from Jersey. You know, I'm not like... I, dude, I didn't mean yeah. to insult don't you. Don't offend me. They, don't offend me. They call, they call uh, Jersey the Garden sure. State. Is it not? Sure. I think something went wrong when they were planning where to put the garden. I think they said they were going to put in New York. Somebody messed up. Couple inches too far to the left. I don't know. Big mistake. Smelly place. You ever been to New Jersey? Of course you have. I've been there. Man, I had some great times. So, I mean, I got dropped on my head there. Sure. I was just talking to Booker T. He put me through a table, broke some bones on my back. Man, Jersey, I love to work there, but God dang, it's, it's, it cut my damn uh, career short a few years. Yeah, I mean, the sad thing about Jersey is you're not the only person that that probably happened to. I think that happens to everybody that lives there. It's a disgusting place. But in New York, where I was born and bred, Long Island, Plainview, Long Island, New York, uh, that's where I grew up. Uh, mother, father, two sisters. And uh, I grew up just better than most. You know, I had a really good living. Uh, I, I can't complain. I had everything I wanted and more. It was awesome. Well, you're, you're in the business right now. What are you, 22 years old? Yes, sir. Man, you got a young, young start. And that's great to get started so young. I didn't start till I was probably 23, 24, which is still young. But right now, man, to have three years in the business at such a young age is is awesome. And I'm watching you work. And it's a lot of high-level stuff. And we'll get to that in a minute. But, dude, when did you start watching the business? Because, oh, I mean, I, I'm imagining you probably were a regular at the uh, Nassau Coliseum. Because isn't that right down your neck of the woods? Oh, yeah. Nassau Coliseum. Coliseum, uh, Madison Square Garden. My father was always willing and able to pay for those, uh, bring me to the shows, buy the tickets. Uh, but the first time I was introduced to wrestling, it was because of my uncle, my uncle Alan. And uh, we were having a house party at his place. Very, very nice house. Very big house, obviously. He's a freedman. And uh, we're watching the TV and we're clicking around on the channels. And out of nowhere, I see this big, gigantic dude who's got a red mask on. And I go, what is that? And I'm like, I don't know, probably six, seven. And it was Kane. And I only saw bits and pieces of the match. And <laughs> my cousin stole the remote from me, changed it. He, he, yeah, we don't need to watch that crap. I said, no, 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 we need to watch. What was that? And then after that, I uh, pretty much begged my father. Uh, I said, we need to go to Hollywood Video immediately. Uh, we went to Hollywood Video. Uh, we... Not we, me. I grabbed a stack of every single professional wrestling disc I could find. But the one that caught my eye was there was a photograph of this man that kind of looked like a zombie. And his hand was like reaching out. Uh, and on the back of this DVD, it said, Hell in a Cell match. 
uh, Mankind versus Undertaker. I go, I don't know what that is, but it sounds cool. And the first match I ever watched in full was that match. So right off the bat, I was like, this stuff is barbaric, and I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. Man, the funny thing about that night is I had just been uh, three or four days in Herman Hospital in Houston, Texas. I had just got finished working with Mankind. We had sold out to Houston Summit. Now that's where Joel Osteen packs them in every Sunday and preaches. But that was a building we used to run. 18,000 strong. My mother and father, they've only came to maybe two of my matches. That was one that they came to. Caught a staph infection that match, and after the match, I mean, I just couldn't stop shaking and shivering, and so they hauled me to the hospital. Turns out I had staph, put a bunch of fluids into me. So I stayed in the hospital for a couple of days, and that pay-per-view, hold on, which pay-per-view was that? Oh, uh, it uh, King of, was it King of the Ring? King of the Ring, no, it was, whatever it was. Yeah. I was in the hospital because that was that match. Sure. And so anyway, that was, I think, the semi-main. Yeah. Now, that stole the show. Mm. That was match of the year. That was a match that no one that ever witnessed it will ever forget. Yeah. And especially the two guys, Taker and uh, Mick Foley, Mankind, that pulled it off and just told an epic story. And the things that went wrong during the match, which made, which made it even more devastating and such a spectacle. We, myself and Kane, were the main event that night. Yeah. So we're in a first blood match. So... You know, whoever makes the other person bleed first wins the match. Mm. Well, when you've just seen all that shit that you just saw, all yeah. that great stuff, epic stuff that those guys pulled off, and the crowd was with it hook, line, and sinker because it was Mick Foley and it was Undertaker and it was, you know, that big-ass sell, it was amazing. So me and Kane went out there and worked our balls off. <laughs> and I love Kane. <laughs> And, man, this is when he was still talking with that voice uh, thing pressed yep. to his throat, and he really had that mystique about him. And it was such a great gimmick, and, he, and everything that he's done has always been top-notch to begin with. But, dude, going back to that night, it just brings up a memory of – you're going out there, you're giving it your best, you're doing the best you can. I'm over as hell, Kane's over, but that is one of those things where you are just not going to follow yeah. the match in front of you. Yeah. So how old are you? And I could always tell a story, man. I was seven or eight, and I was changing channels on a manual TV. We don't have the remote controls that the Freedmen's have back here in sure. this modern technology day. Almost no one does. I mean, we were paupers compared to you guys, sure. right? Absolutely. We were the Williamses, you know, and then I changed my name to Austin to try to rise the level, okay? Just trying to work with smart, you here. Smart. Smart. So anyway, I'm changing channels, and man, I see this smoke-filled arena, and I dusty roads bleeding like a stuck pig in the middle of the ring, and it's just a rope banister around the, the ring, just one light hanging over the squared circle. It was magic, and man, there's a security guard walking with a sidearm on his hip, just circling the ring. This is how it was back in the days. I was seven or eight years old. My mom was over there reading her magazine, Red Book. And, man, Dusty's bleeding like a stuck pig. I figured the security guard's got a damn gun. He, he can help Dusty out. So I, I looked over at my mom. I said, Mom, I said, why don't that guard help Dusty? <laughs> she looked up, looked at the TV, rolled her eyes, and went back to reading Red Book Magazine. But forevermore, I was hooked. And ever since, you know, going through my junior high, high school days, even mm -hmm. in college, I always knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted, I wanted to be a rock and roll singer first, but I, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And then going to the sportatorium, like I was telling you before we started rolling sound, and my buddy said, man, you got to get into this. You're as big as Carrie. And no, I wasn't big as Carrie Von Eric, but, and seeing that commercial gave me the impetus to say, hey, man, this is what I want to do. So back to you, your young kid coming from a, high rolling family, very well to do. You fall in love with the business. So is your dad cool with it? Was it too violent? Would he take you to every uh, venue that you wanted to go to? I mean, here's the thing. Uh, from a, when I was a fan, he was super into it, uh, super willing to go wherever we had to go. Uh, Would have bought out the whole stadium if I asked him to. So yeah, it was, it was great. It was fun. Uh, of course it was. And honestly, I wish he did. There were a lot of undesirable people at these shows. I'm not going to lie to you, Steve. Would he, would he ever just buy a whole section out just to keep some of the germ factor well, away? Well, of course. But I'm talking about buying the whole stadium. I was a little I offended you. he didn't, but completely b sidebar. That's completely beside the I, I'm with you. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, going to those shows were great. But the, uh, the moment I realized that I wanted to be a pro wrestler was when we were at Madison Square Garden. It was the first ever elimination chamber. And in the main event, uh, Shawn Michaels was an absolute crimson mask. 
and he hits his pose and I look to my left, I look to my right and everyone's standing up and clapping and I go, I could do that. I could totally do that. And that was the moment. And look, I can totally do it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it really good. So how old were you when that happened? Oh man. Uh, I don't know. So I was born in 1996, you know, you graduated from high school, right? Uh, at, at that point. Yeah. No, but you graduated from oh, school, right? Before you yeah. got into business. Yeah. What am I, poor? Yeah. Uh, I know I know from your football days, and basically everybody was trying to recruit you. You were going to go to an Ivy League school. Yes. Uh, what happened? Because you, you skipped college and went into pro wrestling school. Sure. So what happened there? So I had a full ride to an Ivy League college that legally I can't disclose. Of course. Um, because there's some issues. I like to issues. ask the hard questions here, Max, but, I, but I'm with you. you Steve. Know, you, you, you can't disclose what you can't disclose. Absolutely. Now, let, let's go into the factoids here. I was an, I was an all-state middle linebacker. Uh, I broke the tackles. You can Google this, people, if you want to. I broke the tackles in Plainview JFK, the record. I had about 115 in one season. And uh, I was offered pretty much a full ride. Uh, and I get there after about a week, we're doing, uh, what they call hell week to me, it was average week. There was nothing special about it. You know, run there and back 70 times. I got first place every time do a, do a, like, I don't know, a thousand push ups. I was done 30 minutes before everybody else. You get it, Steve. You're a, you're a freak athlete. You sound like, like you're me. bored with it. Absolutely. And I was, and, uh, the head coach came up to me. I was a freshman and he looked at me, he goes, uh, Friedman, we're thinking about starting you this year. And he was allowed to call you Friedman? Look. Not mister? Here's the thing, all right? I didn't want to slap this guy around. He didn't know any better, okay? But I, I, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. Copy. And I'm not going to lie to you, Steve. I didn't get butterflies. I didn't feel anything. I didn't, I didn't think to myself, yeah, this is what I want for four years. So this is where the story gets a little crazy. I go to my dorm, and I was dorming with another linebacker who was nowhere near as good as me, honestly, very jealous kid, felt bad for him. But I look at him, I go, I don't know if this is for me. I think I want to be a pro wrestler. He looked at me, he left the room. This is a God's honest true story, left the room. And I thought, huh, that's weird. The next morning I get called into the uh, coach's office. This triple chinned piece of crap, he looks at me. Your roommate rolled on you, he knocked on you. Of course he did, because that's, that's what disgusting poor middle cl- don't get me started okay gotcha, don't get me gotcha. started on this is it face we don't have all day what a teammate yeah great guy i slide in the office here's this pudgy head coach he looks at me and he goes heard you thinking about leaving and i said yeah well coach i'm not gonna lie to you i don't know if this is for me i know what i want to do with my life and he looks at me he goes can't have you do that i go what what I'm fairly certain that's not how that works, coach. Like, I got to go. He goes, no, no, no. You are one of the best recruits we've ever seen, hands down. And we spent too much time, money, and effort on you. You're not going anywhere. Probably blew the budget recruiting your ass. I mean, Steve, I am fairly certain that they spent at least half of the expenses on that college campus. And so I can imagine the heartbreak and... This guy was crying, yeah, Steve. I mean, his job's probably depending on you. Completely crying. And I go, well, I don't know if that's up to you, sir. And he goes, well, I'm going to have to assign you an accountability, buddy. I didn't know what that meant. In walks this six seven O lineman. Uh, for, for story purposes, because, again, I'm not trying to get sued. I have a lot of money, but who wants to you get sued? You want to hang on to your money, Max, no matter Thank how you. much you got. Exactly. He, this guy gets it. I know the people listening probably don't understand what we're talking about, but this guy gets it. Uh, from there, uh, that O lineman followed me everywhere. Let's call him. Let's call him Sal. That O lineman followed me everywhere. If I went to the bathroom, he followed me. If I went to the girls' dorm, he followed me. Everywhere I went, he followed for about two straight days. And I waited till about two a.m. for Sal to finally nod off, go to sleep. I packed the essentials. After eating his jelly donuts. Oh God. Disgusting. Fat, disgusting slob. Don't get me started. Sorry about that bad it's memory. Okay. Oh so, my God. so it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Yeah. You trying you, to make me gag here, Steve? Yeah, yeah you, you, you got to make a getaway yeah. here. I rushed to my truck. I don't imagine you driving a truck. Oh. <laughs> Dodge do Ram, beautiful, graphic. Hemi. No, 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 no. Oh. See, here's the thing. What am I going to take a Camaro to a campus? I don't need these schmucks breaking my windows, okay? True. Well, I'll bring, like, my fourth car, which is the, I get a nice truck, beautiful gotcha. Hemi. You, you, you like trucks, right? I love them. Yeah. I've heard. So I've heard. I drive home, all the way home. And my parents 
I wake up and immediately, what are you doing here? They weren't happy to see you? No, not happy at all. Uh, how can you do this? You're, you're blowing a free college education. And I looked at them and I said, I know what I want to be. I want to be a professional wrestler. My mother just instantly cried and she left the room. And my father, he looked at me. And am I allowed to curse on this? Yeah, let's, let's not drop too many F bars. Right. Yes. This is the, the one on the podcast. The Absolutely, podcast. because it means something. This means something. What the f are you thinking? To which my response was, I don't know, I just want this. And he looked back at me and he said, Well, if you're going to do this, we're going to find you the best school, the best trainers. If you mess this up, you're, you're done. You're done. And I said, all right, bet. And then off I went. When we looked up uh, the nearest school to us, which was in Hicksville, Long Island, uh, create a pro. And that's where I got my start. What did the class, what did the instruction entail? I remember back in the day, you know, our first few days, first few weeks, it was basic t tumbling drills, learning how to take a, a flat back bump, slapping a mat, protecting yourself. We'd get into the chain wrestling later. But you were trained by, what, Pat Buck and Kurt Hawkins? Oh, yeah. Am I correct? Yeah, the learning tree there is nuts. You got Pat Buck, who uh, was in OVW, and he got to learn from guys like Danny Davis and Rip Rogers. Okay, stop. Sure. My Danny Davis story. Before we started rolling sound, I was telling you the stories about I started calling my matches at a very early age mm. because I don't hear very well. I'll never forget working with Lawler. He booked me with him three nights in a row. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it was Memphis, Louisville, and Evansville. And probably the worst matches Lawler's ever had in his life. I'm green as grass. I look good. But all of a sudden, you know, Lawler's kind of guy likes, likes to start calling spots, you know, as you're pacing around the ring. I wasn't used to hearing spots t to begin with, you know, but when I am listening to spots back then, I was used to being in a headlock or in a lockup or something, right? Yeah. So we're pacing around the ring and Lawler ventriloquist, ventriloquist style starting to call a high spot. And so, and as he's, you know, walking around the ring, talking like this. Talking through his teeth. I, yeah, because most times I'm also reading lips as I'm listening to people. Well, I can't read his lips and I can't hear him because I'm deaf. <laughs> we went through after, after he made the call three times each time. And this is before I created the what gimmick in WWE. You know, I, he, he'd make the call. I'd go, what? He'd do it again. We kept pacing, just kept pacing. What? After the third what, it turned into a real basic match. Sure. So, but Danny Davis, one time, uh, like I told you, USWA was a weekly territory. And so I know I've already seen the booking sheet. I'm working with Nightmare Danny Davis, who was wonderful to me and took me under, you know, his arm and his learning tree and taught me so much. And we get to the building and I go up to Danny. I say, hey, Danny, I said, uh, we're working tonight. I said, what do you want to do? And he goes, oh, Steve, uh, leave it up to you. You call it. I said, Danny, I said, normally when I'm driving to the building, I'm trying to think of some stuff, you know, because, you know, you're the, you're the veteran. I just figured uh, I would listen to you tonight. He goes, no, I've seen you work. If you get lost out there, I'll help you out. And so that's how cool Danny Davis was to me. And I got to give big ups to him. But anyway, uh, Danny Davis, um, Rip Rogers, you're there. Go ahead. Sure. And that's, that's Pat's learning tree. And then you got Hawkins, who's been in the WWE his whole entire adult life, pretty much from, from, he got signed at 18, 19, and he's still there now. He's, I, I think he's in his 30s now, early 30s. Right. Uh, so, yeah, man. Just, But I never really heard of Pat Buck, but I started reading his resume and seeing all the places th th these guys traveled. I mean, those guys got a lot of miles behind them and a lot of matches. Yeah. I didn't know that they were experienced because when I first started thinking, and that was Kurt Hawkins, uh, I think it was his gimmick name before I got to Kurt Hawkins. But anyway, I was like, man, well, who are these guys? I've never heard of them. Then I started researching their background. I said, holy shit, these guys are real workers. These guys have been around. So how did you take, let's go back to the question. What, what did the uh, opening drill stuff kind of consist of? I mean, here's the thing, okay? My first day in, it was uh, me and Pat Buck. That was my first day of training. And uh, right off the whip, you could tell I was a top-tier athlete. I mean, I was blowing all these guys who have already been there like for a year, totally out of the water. Duh. We were going to the bump drill, killing it. Lock up, killing it. You know what? Screw it. Let's do up and overs, killing it. So, I mean, pretty much since day one, I was an absolute prodigy. And that's me being humble, Steve. I'm not going to lie to you. Which, by the way, people call me humble all the time, and I really do appreciate it. But sometimes I have to explain to the you, the viewers, the listeners, um, 
just how great I am, you know? And yeah, since day one, really, it was, it was easy stuff. But, but day one, it was uh, learning how to bump, lockups, and I, and I did do up and overs in the class. They pretty much, they threw me right in, which I think was incredibly beneficial because sometimes I feel like, I've, I've gone, I've checked out other schools, sometimes I feel like if you on day one are just learning one thing, and you do that for months. While it's going to make that one thing great, sometimes I think it's good to be thrown into the, the, the lion's den and just learn on the fly and try, to, and try to get to everybody else's level, you know? And honestly, I, I cannot think of a better school in the tri-state area. Like, if you, if you live in the tri-state area and you don't go to Creative Pro, you're nuts. These guys are so good, Pat and Brian. are so good. Now, earlier in the podcast, I called you Max. Okay, are, are you cool with me calling you Max? Because I didn't clear that with you. you Look, know, I've got, you know, obviously, I am Stone Cold Steve Austin. I left a pretty decent mark in the business. I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke up in my, my own ass, but it is what it is. Do you mind if I call you Max? Steve, I'm going to let it slide, okay? Because we're in your home. You working with me? But just to clarify, if you see me out on the streets and you Maxwell, say that, Maxwell, Jacob, Friedman. I, I will level you. Gotcha. Okay? I can Thank work you. with that. All right. But anyway, back to it. Uh, so was it what you expected it would be? I mean, this, and, and this, is, this is serious. This is an absolute shoot. The second I walked into the ring, I felt like I was at home. I don't know if you felt the same way the first day of training, but the second I stepped foot in the ring, I was like, God damn it. I feel like I'm supposed to be here. I feel like I'm meant to be here. I did feel that too. I I, I, did, I wasn't as a natural as you were. No one. The is. only things that I am, well, I could expect to be, but the only thing that I was a natural at was just attacking those ropes, hitting those ropes. And you know, Mick, Mick Foley tells a story. There used to be a, a like a kayfabe section with some some fencing in front of. It. We called that the crow's nest. Mm -hmm. And when uh, guys would uh, we'd work on Friday night and Saturday morning, you know, that's where the family would watch from, either their wives or their girlfriends. That's where they would work from. And uh, so Mick, you know, he got to the town early. You know, he'd been coming in back and forth from Tennessee. So he was kayfabing up there in the crow's nest. That was uh, after the Saturday show, he was just killing time. And he noticed there's this one kid out there with long blonde hair with a pretty good physique just hitting the ropes like a maniac. Hard. And he said, that guy has a future in this business. And it turns out he was, he was right. Yeah. But, but, uh, but to, to your point, I did feel at home once I got inside that, that ring. And I'll never forget when I went to that seminar talking to Chris Adams. Uh, I don't know how it was for you, but he was doing this presentation and it was also a moneymaker as well, right? You're getting 30 kids to kick in 45 mm -hmm. bucks. That's some money. So man, I'm dressing up. I, I ain't got no money. I'm on an athletic scholarship. And I put on my black jabos, my purple shirt, my eyes dot shirt, my black loafers. I look like a million bucks for me, right? And I, stu I stood out in the crowd just because I was probably the only athletic one there. Heavyweight people. I thought like, like almost like all these monsters would show up that, you know, I was used to seeing in the ring. Yeah. But it was just like, you know, real, a real normal array of people. And uh, Chris kept singling me out because he recognized me. And uh, I had, had a good look back in the day. And he knew that I could be, you know, the face of his uh, school because he's a smart guy. And uh, he asked me what I was doing. I said, well, yeah, I come from a football background. I just got finished playing football at North Texas State. And through his presentation, he goes, you know, just because you played football doesn't mean you're going to be any good. My mother, shitty English accent. Doesn't mean you're going to be able to make it in pro wrestling. And then two or three more times, he kind of called me out. And at the end of the seminar, I told him, I said, I said, hey, dude, he goes, Steve, he goes, it was good talking to you. And I, I got to give him that come to Jesus meeting. And I looked up to him and Chris was a little out there and uh, he could be, and he was a good guy to me. And I said, listen, dude, I said, you keep talking about my football background. I said, if you teach me how to do this, I can. Mm. He goes, uh, okay, Steve, we'll see. Anyway, that's how it went for me. So back to the school. Uh, when I, when I got in, we were in one ring, 25 to 30 people. Okay. So man, you, you got to take a lot of rotations to sure. try to get some reps in on, on that kind of a deal. How many people were in your the learning setting with what went on, and what's the name of that school? Create a Pro. Okay, Create a Pro. How many cats are there? How many rings, instructors? Tell me about it. One ring, um, and I lucked out because when I first started going, there was about like eight, ten kids normally a class. So I got a lot of ring time. Um, we all did. And they made it a point to make sure that all of us got a lot of attention and a lot of ring time together. Uh, the thing is now there's like... God, if I, sometimes I show up to create a pro and there's like 
God, I don't even like 20 kids there just rolling around. I'm like, Jesus, which is amazing. It's a testament to how great the school is doing. But yeah, I got, I got a lot of ring time. I was very fortunate. And also there's so many amazing v- veterans there too that come through to create a pro because everybody respects Pat and Hawkins. So uh, like I would have guys like Alex Reynolds. Uh, he, he was in PWG. I mean, God, there's so many people. Uh, Trent, Trent came in one day, uh, Trent Beretta. Um, there's, there's some other guys in the area that are amazing. Like VSK, who I know people listening to this might not know who he is, but as you know, there are some people that stick around in certain territories that are amazing talents. It's just, they're just waiting for that break. Um, and he's, he was awesome. Um, God, there was just, there was just so many people that it was a revolving door of just awesome people that were willing to give great advice and God, it, you would have to be an idiot not to try to soak it up. Okay, so how long was it before you had your first match? And, and before you answer that, how many days a week were you in this school? Oh, dude, I was there. If there was a if there was a practice day, I was in there every day up until my first match. And it was how many uh, hours? Um, let's see. Practice starts at seven, ends at nine, and then there's open ring from like ten to eleven. Sometimes Brian uh, Hawkins would leave, give the key to one of the the vets, and I would stay there to like freaking one in the morning you know what i mean so yeah i i did not waste time because i i wanted to be the best so and this was every day this was uh tuesdays wednesdays and thursdays dude that's pretty good yeah i mean that's was a shitload better than one time a week oh yeah is, is that was your situation oh one dude time a week? it was after the saturday uh morning show which was the television taping which went out that night on a uh shit i was khou tv channel 11 that was a live TV taping, and then everybody cleared it out. When the Mars cleared it out, that's when we f- filtered in and yeah. got our lessons in. So once a week, dude, and it's hard to get it get good at anything one time a week. It's like I was telling you again before we were rolling sound in the USWA in the Tennessee territory. You're working the same towns every single night, same shit. It's a loop. And so there's no better place to get your chops up by sure. working, you know, shit, five, six towns every single night. You always got to change your shit up. You always call in different shit. Got to work a different body part. Mm. So it really does speed up the learning process. Uh, as far as the learning process, you're putting in all these extra hours. Uh, you, you like the open ring time. Uh, like at that point uh, before your first match, what were you focusing on? Because when I watch you now at three years in the business, and I know you like to uh, – uh, deservedly so, toot your own horn about how good you are yeah. at, at two to three years. But when Kurt Angle came through the doors in WWF back in the 96, 97, whenever he got there, he won a, a gold medal in 96. All of a sudden, man, I see the stud athlete uh, who won this gold medal. I'm thinking, hey, man, it's a lot of these guys with this shoot mentality, they don't quite pick it up. Uh, not Kurt. I mean, he kind of picked it up in, in, a, in a, a faster fashion than anybody I'd ever seen pick up the business. And then all of a sudden, just a few years later, be in championship pitchers, and he was just a prodigy. And he'll go down as one of the greatest of all time. Uh, speaking to your abilities, I'm, I've been uh, very impressed with all the matches that I've watched on YouTube, and I've probably seen 10 or 12 of your matches. So the character work come first, the ring work, mechanics, psychology. Talk to me about putting all the pieces together to be where you're at now. Personally. Uh, first of all, god damn, tuna fish and potatoes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dude, it wasn't caviar and all that oh, shit you Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, god, this is, I'm not going to lie to you, Steve. I don't think I've ever hung around uh, somebody like you, so this is a little rough for me. And I'm it, trying my best to compose myself. And I want to apologize for, for buying you this cheap this ass cheap brand. spring water from Trader Joe's. What do you I think? I thought you used to drink sparkling water. Dude, it's not even, come on. It, I feel like an idiot. I asked I, for room temperature when I talked to your guy before I came here. <laughs> And I'm dealing with this horse shit. But it's fine. Steve, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, all right. To the, to the question you asked. Okay. Because um, if you know, Maxwell, at the end of this interview, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you. There's two ways out of here. Sure. You can take the window. You can take the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead with the answer. Uh, as, long as, as long as a servant catches me on the outside, I'm fine. <laughs> but, um, no, I, I was always absolutely mesmerized by promos. That's what got me into professional wrestling, which is funny to hear because the first match I ever saw was one of the most gruesome matches in the history of the yeah. business. But but two very distinguished characters. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, Undertaker and Mankind. It's just two larger-than-life characters. So when I was... I'm, the, the bottom line is, just like you, MJF is, is just... It's me. It's me turned up. It's me turned up. And um, when I was younger... 
all the way up till now, I knew exactly who I wanted to be in this business. I knew exactly how I wanted to talk, how I wanted to look, how I wanted to present myself. So that did come first. Uh, secondary, uh, I never knew how I wanted to present and, and structure what I did in front of a crowd. That part was all creative pro. Uh, that's all them. And I, f I fell in love with people picking apart body parts. I love that. Just slowing it down. Cause quite frankly, I don't care what these losers listen to this podcast think, you know, if I can slow a match down, get my, get my air. I'm here to make money. I'm not here to make friends. I like that. I like watching, uh, Regal. I liked watching Fit Finley. I liked watching, uh, we talked about it earlier, Hot Stuff, Eddie Gilbert. I liked watching Tully. I liked watching Ric Flair. Those are the guys whose style I try to emulate. And that came second, secondary. And once I was able to put all that together, now you people, honestly, you don't deserve it, but now you people get the finished product. That is Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Were you ever a fan of Jerry the King Lawler? Absolutely. Because how, he how was a master on the mic, but his pacing in the ring and the way he wrestled, uh, and he was, he was more of a brawler than a wrestler, mm. uh, and I just loved his style. For a guy, when I, and I'm watching some of your matches when you're a year and a half, two years in the business, one of the biggest mistakes green guys make is rushing things in the ring just because – you're in such a damn hurry to get a response to make your next decision to get your next response. It's, you're just all of a sudden, hell, I'll never forget out there. I just went to the Tennessee Territory, Dutch Mantel game in the Steve Austin name. I'm working as a baby face. I believe we're at a spot show in Lebanon, Tennessee. And Dutch comes up to me and he goes, shit, go out there and give us, give us about eight to ten minutes. I was working with a guy under a hood. And uh, you'll go over how are we going to go over. And all of a sudden, you know, we go out there and just completely shit the bed. And, you know, hell, I thought we'd just told a damn masterpiece of a story. And he got me and he said, Chris Champion, Chris Champion just passed away. Uh, shout out to him, old travel partner who taught me a lot. Uh, Chris Champion came over and Dutch put a, he said, put a headlock on Chris. And I put a headlock on Chris and I had him way down here. He goes, God, no, not like that. Pull him up here so he can hear what he's telling you. And so he started straightening me out and got up my ass. And he said, you see that chair over there? It's a steel chair, the kind we used to nailing people with. And he said, I said, yeah. He goes, you get that damn steel chair. You set it out there in the damn uh, door. And you, you, you watch every single match on the card. He goes, it's the only way you're going to learn this shit. So that come to Jesus meeting with Dutch really was lit a fire into my ass. And from, from that point on. I watched damn near every match on the card. So uh, with your pacing, uh, were you ever one of those guys that rushed things in the beginning in that year, year and a half period? Right off the whip, I realized I would watch these guys run around like a chicken without its head and just going crazy, just, just being out of breath, uh, not knowing where they're at in the match. And to me, when, when I get to watch... Uh, all this old school wrestling that I love. That's my, that's my bread and butter. Uh, I realized that the match was always way better when these guys took their time. And you can hit those big moves, but how are you going to get there? Do you need to rush to it? Are you going to sell? Are you going to wait for it? Are you going to give the crowd time to even realize what they've seen? Because if we're running back and forth like rabid wolves... They're not going to be able to comprehend what's going on because they're dumb, you know? I mean, you people listen to this. I, I hate that to tell you, but look in the mirror. You're really dumb. So you got to spoon feed this stuff to them. And uh, I realized that at a pretty early stage. With where you're at doing your thing on the independent scene all across the United States, probably all over the world, people know of you and your exploits and your accomplishments. The business has really sped up. I mean, a lot of days, quite frankly, is trying to put 20 pounds of shit in a 10-pound bag, mm -hmm. and it just don't fit, but they want to put it in there anyway. And I'm not going to be the grizzled veteran, but going back to, you know, my days watching, you know, superstar Bill Dundee and Lawler tell these epic loser leaves town stories and taking their time and holy, just building those moments. You're not rushing things in the ring. I haven't seen you do anything insanely dangerous. You know, some of those pile driver spots and some of the things, you know, anything and everything is a risk. Let me put that first and foremost in the squared circle. One time we was working in Hull, Ontario. 
which is kind of like a B town. And house was the real shits. Uh, I was working with Triple H, me, it was a bunch of guys in a, in a like a six man tag match. And we said, hey, man, just guys, everybody kind of be cool. You know, we got Monday Night Raw tomorrow, nobody get hurt. Sure enough, Triple H is running the ropes, damn near blows out a knee. So it's, it's, it's just running the ropes sometimes can just so completely. So he's the dumbest. Jet. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been, able, you've been able to stay out of harm's way, but my point, my, my question is, and not to uh, beat a dead horse and keep rambling, that's what I like to do. It is my podcast. You're pretty good at it. With everybody wanting to go hurry up faster, 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 you maintain this pacing, which I love. Does it concern you that everybody's trying to go faster and you do your thing, or I, does that make you even more unique? I'm not worried about everybody else. I'm worried about me. Uh, the, the bottom line is... Can I go that pace? Absolutely. Do I sometimes? Absolutely. One of the people I really uh, watch a lot of tape on is Chris Candido. To me, that was a guy who was able to speed up at the right moments and to slow down at the right moments. And he would do some cool stuff, man. Dude did a powerbomb off the top rope. Uh, Piscatos, suicide dives, pile drivers. Uh, he did incredibly innovative stuff, but he rated for the right moment. He knew when to speed it up and he knew when to slow it down. Um, you knew when to speed it up and you knew when to slow it down. That, that's, that's what separates, uh, good wrestlers from guys like Maxwell Jacob Friedman, you know, great wrestlers, right? You know, me and you, so to speak. Sure. Let's take a quick pause for the calls and get big ups to true car. Here's some useful car tips you might not be aware of. Putting your floor mat under your tires in the winter can help get your car out in the snow. Removing excess weight from your car will improve gas mileage. Oh, and if you live in California, put your parking brake on whenever you park. Every time. Ready for one more tip you might not know about? True Car also helps people get used cars. That's right. True Car isn't just for buying new cars. With their certified dealer network and nationwide inventory of nearly 1 million used cars, you'll enjoy real pricing on actual inventory and a simpler buying experience, whether you buy new or used. And with True Car, users can see what others paid so they know if they're getting a good deal before buying. They're also more likely to enjoy a faster buying experience by connecting with True Car certified dealers. When you're ready to buy a new or used car, check out True Car and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. You're also going to need some car insurance for that car. Go to Geico.com, and in 15 minutes, you could be saving 15% or more on car insurance. That's right. Save hundreds of dollars on car insurance at Geico.com. Extra money in your pocket? It may just be the most rewarding thing you do today. Oh, oh. When it comes to safety, nothing is more important than your vehicle's brakes. If it's hard to stop or you hear squealing or grinding noises during braking, stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts. You'll find the brake parts you need from trusted brands like BrakeBest and BrakeBest Select at everyday low prices. Play it safe with brakes from O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices, every day. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Football season is here, and Podcast One Sportsnet has got you covered when it comes to perfecting your fantasy football skills. Check out the Pro Football Focus podcast and their NFL podcast, where each week they grade every player on every play of the NFL season to give you a look inside the game nobody else can rival. Then get hip to the Forecast podcast, where they give you the best analytics and gambling tips in the football world. Be the envy of your fantasy league and get the hottest tips from your PFF, NFL, and Forecast podcast every week on Podcast One or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. If you love the show, tell your friends and leave a rating and review. Hey guys, as you know, I did my very first DDPY workout with Dallas back in June. I was blown away by how much I dug it, how different it was than anything I've been doing, and I'm still sticking with it. I made a commitment, and I'm still going strong. I've been doing my regular workouts with the DDP Yoga Now app, and I'm feeling a difference, more flexibility than ever. And if you really want to see the power of DDPY in action, you have to watch Dallas's new real-life reality series, We Can Rebuild You. Dallas has been working with disabled veteran Jerry Cameron, whose only goal is to be able to walk again without his walker. So far, 
Jerry has gone from barely being able to get out of a chair to doing some of his DDPY workouts without needing his walker at all. You can follow Jerry's progress at ddpyoga.com slash rebuild. Have you been looking to get on board with DDP Yoga? Well, there's no excuse not to because Dallas has given you seven days free to try it out. That is a week to try out the program, explore the app, and own your life, and it's completely free. You're going to need a week because there's a lot of content in there, a lot of recipes, a lot of motivation to help your ass out. Out. DDP Yoga can work for all ages, all weights, all fitness levels. It's a kick-ass cardio workout that will dramatically increase your flexibility and strengthen your core like never before, all with minimal joint impact. Just for listeners of the Steve Austin Show, you can save 20% off all DVDs and annual memberships for the DDP Yoga Now app. Just go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin to take advantage and check us out. Dallas has some awesome workshops coming up, including Toronto, Canada, this Saturday, September 22nd. Get all the info at ddpyogaworkshops.com. Or if you just want to meet Dallas, catch him at the Rhode Island Comic Con, November 2nd through 4th. Tickets and information at ricomicon.com. This is the Steve Austin Show. When I watch you, sometimes uh, a, a few names come to my mind. A little bit of cult here and there. Sure. And a little bit, uh, sometimes uh, maybe a little bit of Lawler. Sometimes, God dang, what was it? One of those guys I told you, I was talking with Court of MLW earlier. There's a couple of people that, that, that you, you remind me uniquely of Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Sure. Uh, with total respect. But there's a couple of people that, that you remind me of. Uh, when you're watching, since you're this mega fan from way back in the day and just this, this – you know, people would, you know, you probably would not want people to know what a freak of wrestling you are as far as the knowledge of the stuff that you've studied and watched because you love the business. But but who are people that are, are definite uh, inspirations on you or, or, or left their mark on you from that, hey, man, this is kind of neat. Maybe I need to craft this to my own way, but influenced you. To me, the GOAT, to me, I have two. There's Flair, obviously. And then there's Piper. To me, Piper was a guy who did almost nothing and had a crowd at the edge of their seat the whole entire time because you never knew what he was going to do next. He had those wild eyes, and he drew you in, man. Whether you liked him, whether you loved him, whether you hated him, he drew you in. So I, a lot of Piper, uh, a lot of Rick Rude. Um, God. I mean, just hot stuff Eddie Gilbert I mentioned before. I watched a lot of his stuff. Those are the, I would say those are the main ones. And then obviously I'm influenced, uh, by my own trainers. I mean, if you watch, uh, if you want to look up, uh, platinum Pat Buck in OVW, the hit maker, he did a lot of great heel stuff, man. Like a lot of great character stuff. Hawkins, obviously great, great character stuff, but I've always, since day one, I was drawn in by the the guys that didn't necessarily care what the people thought the guys that had one mission and it was to be the best those kinds of characters so as far as the goat goes i'm with you i'm a flair guy he is the goat uh roddy piper to me like you said very economical and the thing that was so powerful about roddy was if he was a heel, he was going to make you hate him. If he was a baby face, you were going to love him because he knew what to do. And it was always that fire and, you know, that mm-hmm. just, I mean, it, it, it was fire, whether it's baby or heel, it was just directed in a different fashion. But also, you know, Lawler, uh, you know, Bachwinkle, but another guy who was so economic in the ring that you watched every single thing he did because it was all geared around getting that DDT after a short arm clothesline and the promos, the menacing promos, Jake the Snake Roberts, oh, yeah. a guy who basically, I don't know how many high spots the guy really did, and, and high spots are transition. It's just the way to get to a different part of the match. But he would do high spots, but it wasn't a high spot centric match. And it was all about the DDT. That was a guy who commanded your respect, your eyeballs, your attention. And as a promo, because he talked so low, everybody shut the hell up so they could listen to what Jake was saying. And that dude was a menace. One of my favorite promos I've ever watched was Jake the Snake's being interviewed and they put the mic up to his mouth and he's moving his mouth and you can't hear a goddamn word. 
and you're you're like turning up the volume on your computer, your TV, however you're watching it. You're sitting at the edge of your bed, your couch, wherever you're at, and you're like, God damn it, what is this guy saying? I want to know. And then he goes, see that? I don't have to say anything to get your attention. And I lost my shit. That was the coolest thing ever. It was so cool. Just the idea even, the creativity, and to be able to draw you in just by... Just by being himself, just by being present in the moment was absolutely insane. One of my favorite promos that Jake ever did, uh, it was a segment, whatever it was, it was Paul Bearer when he was managing The Undertaker and uh, Jake was out there and I guess he had done something to trap Undertaker's hand inside the casket so mm. he couldn't defend Paul Bearer and then he DDT'd Paul Bearer right there on the floor and he gets up and he just deadpans, he goes, mm, short ride. Bad landing. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> spot on, yeah. mister. It was a short ride. It is a real, real bad landing. Oh, so, yeah. But, but Jake had that presence about him. Uh, as far as uh, a little bit of this, uh, awesome. I know you're just being MJF and, and to, you know, my crowd, w which I love and adore. They've been with me for damn near six years, five years, however long I've been doing this. Uh, you don't think very much of them, obviously. Uh, but uh, you're, you're overwhelmed. Right, you know, you, you know I, there's not too many people, and I'm going to tell you, you know, this is straight up, Max, you come in here and just overwhelm me. But, I mean, you came in here with that badass. What, 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 what shirt is that? What the fabric is that? It's, it's very expensive. It's actually 100% silk. Uh, but, again, you know, I don't, I don't want to turn your viewers off. I don't want them to feel jealousy. I just want them to be able to listen to uh, the smooth, smooth sound of my voice and just enjoy this podcast. You know, I do this show with a working man, and a working man appreciates the guy of your stature coming on a podcast like this every now and then. Absolutely. Hey, let's talk about promos for a second. Uh, were you always, uh, you know, just that gift of gab, talky guy in school? Were, were you a class clown? Or, or I mean, because I've seen you, you, you can be somewhat arrogant, somewhat abrasive. Are you like that 24-7 or... or Tell me, tell me, you, you don't seem to be afraid of a microphone. No, I, I do okay with them. Some of your best stuff is done post-match. Sure. Uh, I appreciate that. My whole entire schooling experience, um, I was very popular. I was able to run with a lot of different circles. I was all-state middle linebacker. I was also all-state tenor one in choir. Tenor two, my apologies. I was in an acapella group. I was on the lacrosse team. I was on the mat wrestling team. But... While I was amazing at all those extra... I'm about to learn. Yeah, there you go. Now you can tell right now, school and me didn't really get along. Uh, I have a terrible attention deficit disorder. It's really bad. But for some reason with wrestling, I was always able to grab my attention. But when I was in a class and some hoity-toity annoying person that thinks they know better than me when they don't and they're talking about PEMDAS and 78 times the square root of... I don't care, you know, how are you going to draw me in? You're not. I don't care what you're about what you're talking about because what you're talking about has nothing to do with what I'm interested in, which uh, happens a lot, unfortunately. So school and me, we didn't really click almost ever. But luckily, and this is also true, uh, because of my accolades in on the gridiron, people would take tests for me. <laughs> people would do my homework, and I would thank them very kindly. And, um, and sometimes, uh, people would get paid. Sometimes they wouldn't have to get paid. Sometimes people would get paid in something else, if you know what I mean, particularly the girls. School was not fun inside the classroom, but school was a hell of a good time outside of the classroom. But you were a talkative guy. You were a popular guy. Oh, I mean, oh yeah. 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 Always, 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 uh, always was the class clown. Always was the funny guy. Always was the athlete. Always was very easy to get, get along with. Uh, always very handsome, always very humble, you know? The, all the the stuff uh, that you would envision me doing in high school, I did, and I did it very well. You know, and one of the things I think is your, is one of your biggest strengths is how humble you are. Oh my God! Right? Yeah. Considering the attributes, the talent that you possess, and and even the 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 potential, sure, the, the unrealized potential that you have yet to acquire, but you can just see oh, it's because it's there for the kid, right? The fact that you're able to keep it together and just be who you are is I find that amazing. Steve, I get stopped on the street all the time, and people go. You must be a martyr. You are just so incredibly nice, so incredibly humble. Just, I can't believe it. And I go, listen, stop making eye contact with me. And I walk away. But I appreciate it. 
I really right. do appreciate it. Yeah, but but they, they they can understand that they don't deserve the time well, of the day from you. I mean, duh. I mean, I mean, I yeah. know that you know that they. Yeah. And sometimes it takes people a while to click on. Segway. Uh, time on the road, life on the road. God dang, I had a effing blast. You've been in the business three years. Uh, you're very well known. You're very successful. You're very busy. Sometimes guys get in trouble on the road. Idle time is a devil's workshop, a lot of people say. Hell of a line. What do you do uh, when you're on the road traveling to and from gigs? Man, I'm a good boy. All right. I don't do drugs. Uh, I, I rarely go out. I honestly keep to myself often, and I keep my circle small. Um, I don't really get in trouble on the road. I have, uh, I have one story where it was a very scary moment uh, that I can tell if you'd like. I'd love to hear a very but it scary is, story. It is the only uh, bad road story I have. I was at House of Hardcore for Tommy Dreamer. Love Dreamer. Uh, good guy. Great guy. Uh, good eye for talent. That's why he books me. I'm at the show, right? And I get there, and we are in upstate New York in, God, bumble crap, uh, 100 pop people population people have less brain cells than they do teeth it's bad it's real bad, real bad. it's real bad steve and uh i don't know where there's this huge biker gang and they're just hanging around some of them are like in the locker room some of them are out of the locker room i go up i go uh, hey tommy what's going on why are these guys here oh they're just they're cool they're chill they're just doing security i go okay um the the night proceeds i have an amazing match obviously uh, i was in a three way was me alex reynolds and um it's we a have great a match. Phenomenal. The crowd's losing it. Obviously, they're all chanting well, my names at the top of, of their there, lungs. They're not a whole lot of them there, but they're losing it. Oh, they're losing it. They're losing it. I, th I think the whole town came. I don't know what happened, yeah. but they were losing it. All chanting my name. I get to the back. We're done. We all go to this uh, little uh, bar, and I went out just because it was the respectful thing to do. There were a lot of great guys there, um, and it was uh, guys the likes of me, Pepper Parks, Alex Reynolds, um... I'm trying to think who else was there. Uh, the Spirit Squad was there. Mike Ma Mike Mondo uh, and Kenny, and then Robbie E. Now Robbie E. buddied up with one of the guys in the biker gang, and they were really getting along. They were having a great time, and I, and I was like, oh, I guess these bikers not so bad, you know. We go back to the hotel. It's me and all these guys. We're all shooting the shit. We're all hanging out. And out of nowhere, Robbie goes, "You know what? Let's go to the let's go to the biker gang's clubhouse." And I guess I'm the only person who's saying, "I go, I don't think that's a good idea at all." I'm not trying to die. And everyone else in the room, because they're all crazy professional wrestlers, go, yeah, that's cool. That sounds like a great idea. Wisely, the two other guys who knew it wasn't a smart idea, Pepper Parks and Alex Reynolds, they tiptoed out of the room. Just as I was about to tiptoe out of the room, uh, one half of the spirit squad, Kenny Dykstra, he looks at me, he goes, hey, kid, where are you going? Well, you know, it's been a long night. I think I'm just going to hit the hay. Uh-uh. Threw the keys at me. You're driving. Great. <laughs> We drive to this secluded area at this biker clubhouse. We pull up. I'm not going to lie to you, Steve. As you can see, I'm, I'm very jacked. I'm a very large individual. But a biker gang's a biker gang, okay? We pull and there's up. strength in numbers. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could probably beat up most of them, but not all. Uh, we open the door, and we're greeted by two gigantic guys with huge scraggly beards. And they're patting us all down. I'm having a panic attack. And then they stop and they go, the wrestlers are here. Give us big hugs. Bring us upstairs. We're having a good time. We're having a blast. We're drinking. We're talking. We're having a great time. Me and Willie are on the side of the room and we're talking to the barkeep of the clubhouse. We're shooting the shit. And honestly, I'm starting to calm down. I'm like, fine. Uh, and then I look over to my left and there is a gigantic Nazi symbol. Um, at that point... Um, I cover my right arm because there is a star of David on it. Yes. And I just pretend, you know, I'm, you know, I just have my arms crossed, got to look tough. And I realize, takes me a couple seconds to absorb all, all the information that's going on. I go, they might not know that I'm Jewish, but they definitely know Willie Mack is, is black. Yeah. I'd imagine they'd know. <laughs> And, uh, so now I'm freaking out and, uh, I start jabbing Willie, Willie, Willie. I'm, you know, I'm Jerry Lawlering it. I'm trying to talk through my teeth <laughs> and Willie turns around. What do you want, fool? Like, stop, stop touching me. What do you want? And, and I'm like, you know, look over there. 
the old head nod trying to trying to point out to the and and willie's like man leave me alone i'm having fun and i was like oh great awesome uh and then best part corner of my right eye a large individual walks right behind willie mack points at the barkeep and mouths what the f is he doing here now there is poop dripping down my leg. I'm having a full-blown panic attack. Um, this is it. This is the end. And the barkeep looks at him and goes, don't worry about it. Like gives him the, uh, you know. Yeah, I, know. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's if, cool. Yeah, it's cool. Don't worry about it. At this point, I get up from my chair. I excuse myself from the conversation with the barkeep. I walk straight up to Kenny Dykstra. <laughs> hey, Kenny. Had a great time, bud. Thanks for making me come out here. Maybe we should go back to the hotel. Man, stop being such a party pooper. What are you talking about, MJF? We're going to chill right here. Ha <laughs> ha, Kenny. We should go right now. Mike Mondo then goes, yeah, I'm pretty tired. Let's go to the hotel. My inner monologue, thank God. We start leaving. We get into the car. I turn the car on. Whew. We're out of here. One of the fine night Nazi bikers knocks on my window. More shit dribbles down my leg. I roll the window down. And he grabs my leg and gets very close to me and goes, Drive safe. Don't text and drive. The last time somebody did that, they got pulled over by a cop and they found our warehouse. And we had to change locations. <laughs> yeah, you got it, man. Absolutely. <laughs> Love you, buddy. You're the best. Uh, start the car up. Get the hell out of there. Get to the hotel. Kick the door in. Fall to the ground. <laughs> uh, I'm kissing the ground. Thank God. I look over to my right. Willie. Willie's doing the same thing. I go, Willie, what's wrong with you? He goes, man, did you see that Nazi symbol? <laughs> <laughs> and that was my night. Well, what was it doing when you was trying to give him the Iggy? Was you just not selling it? He was trying to stay cool, man. Right. Which, by the way, not something a Jewish kid from Long Island's very good at doing. <laughs> I've never been in that situation before. So, yeah, Willie was playing it cool. I never forget I got in the wrestling business. I was traveling up and down the road because, you know, you had to travel with somebody in USWA. And we, you know, heels and baby faces travel separately. And for some reason, Chris championed me. We started traveling together, and Chris was really cool. And right before I had stopped working on the freight dock, I was doing manual labor, you know, loading trucks, driving a forklift, stuff, you know, you would never stoop so low to Absolutely do. Absolutely not. Sounds, but anyway, that was awesome. me. And so I, I'm, I've got this brand-new 1988 Hyundai Excel base model silver four-speed. I put a little bit of a sound system in it now, and I'm listening to some heavy metal. And we're rolling down between towns. I don't know where we was going, to and from Memphis, Louisville, wherever we was at, we was on the road. Chris is over there rolling him a big-ass fat joint. And uh, I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> oh, man. Cause, dude, I got in the business of pro wrestling. I'm a straight-up athlete. Yeah. You know, a scholarship guy. You know, I was in the National Honor Society in high school before I got kicked out. And then, uh, you know, I took my athletics and my training very, very seriously. And at that? this point in my life, you know, I wasn't a big partier. I would drink some whiskey now, but I still was kind of on that straight and narrow path. All of a sudden, you get into the business and you're exposed to all these different things, right? Yes. So as much money as you were exposed to coming up as a freedman, all of a sudden you get in this other world and you're exposed to different things as a professional wrestler. So I'm rolling down the road, man, and... I'm just saying, all right, man, I'm jamming pretty hard. I don't know what I've got on, but it's some pretty heavy shit. And finally, you know, Chris is about to light up. He reaches over and turns my stereo down. He, and, you know, we'd been at the gym that day. And about this time, you know, man, I'm doing 315, you know, reps of 20 for a shoot. And because uh, I was, dude, I was, I was fresh. I hadn't, I wasn't beaten up yet. I wasn't dead dog tired. I wasn't road hard and put up wet. I was yet to be. So anyway, I'm, I'm jacking all these weights in the gym. I'm not, you know, having any flings or anything like that because I'm in a relationship and I'm not doing any party stuff because I'm on a straight and narrow. And he goes, he lights up that joint. He goes, bro, you want some? I, I said, no, nah, man. I said, uh, I said, I don't smoke. He keeps smoking his joint. He gets about three puffs and he, I turn the music back up. He's sitting there. He reaches across and turns the music back down. He goes, you always train like that? I said, yeah, I kind of train a heavy, you know, one I can and try to get a good workout. He goes, uh, you mess with any girls? I, I said, no, man. I said, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm engaged. 
I turned the music back up. We rode a few more miles. He turns the music back down. He goes, he goes, brother, and it was almost like Nostradamus. And this is this is right before the, the money was really the shits. I was just uh, happy to be on, on the team, traveling from town to town, being a pro wrestler, living my dream. Wasn't working on top. I was, I was jerking the curtain every single night, but I was soaking up all the information, having a blast. And he, he, he issues these prophetic words to me. He goes, he goes brother. I didn't know that back then everybody called each other brother, yeah. right? So he goes, brother, in a year, he goes, you're going to be smoking dope. You ain't going to be lifting all those heavy weights, and you'll be divorced. I said, all right, man, here we go. As I turned the music turned back, the music up, right back up, sure enough, a year later, I was smoking dope. <laughs> I was training with about 225, and I had my first divorce under my belt. Yeah. So, yeah, our story is into the business. So, But you stay on the uh, straight now. Do you, do you drink any alcohol at all? I drink sometimes. Honestly, what do you drink? Uh, predominantly just red wine. I don't like to mess around with beer all that much. I'm not a big fan of gluten, uh, but love red wine. Got you. Where are you. Where are you at right now with respect to how busy you are? Because it seems like you're all over the place. I'm seeing you know a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that I'm watching on YouTube. Obviously, there are cameras rolling. I know you're the MLW, middleweight champ, and that's yes, going to be a very you got to be very proud of that. Oh, absolutely. I'm very proud of that. I am the MLW world middleweight champion, uh, very deservedly so. Right now, I'm also the CZW world champion. I am the Inspire uh, Pro uh I believe uh, they call it the prestige title, which is also their world championship, which that's another promotion out in Texas. If you're any, if you have any interest with that, which one is that inspire? Uh, it's another was that that show promotion. you was working? Uh, the, the circus show. Wait, wait. That was, was Wrestle with circus. Leo Rush. Yes. With Leo Rush. That was Wrestle Circus right now. Uh, they're taking a hiatus and the biggest promotion right now out there in Texas is inspire pro. Yeah. So a big shout out to them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm working pretty much nearly every single top tier promotion and I have worked almost every single top tier promotion, uh, on the independent level, uh, up to this point, whether it be in Canada, the U S uh, and in the UK. Um, so it's been great places like AAW, AIW beyond limitless. Uh, I mean the, the list is big. Obviously I love going back to my, my school, create a pro. Um, what do you do when you go back to school? You just like to be in the ring, mess around with, with your guys? Oh, and, yeah. And I mean, I, I definitely like it, – it's it's cool. It's cool to go back to your, your roots. Uh, right now I'm living in uh, – if you can believe this, this is ridiculous. I'm living in Indiana right now. How in the hell did that happen? Bro, beats me. But I will tell you this. I am in a gigantic house, and it is not exactly uh, expensive. Uh, but I, I will also say I like my privacy and when I lived in New York, I had zero privacy. So I'm, I honestly do like the idea that during half of my week, I'm out around going all over the goddamn place. And then when I come to my nice, big, beautiful, gorgeous home with my huge king size bed and I just get to chill and watch Netflix and not have to talk to any more poor people, it's a good time. I don't leave the house, though, because I'm afraid to see what those Indiana people look like. I have no interest in doing that. But when I do get to go home to New York, I do like to visit Creative Pro. I do like to see who the new students are, how they're progressing, how the school's progressing. So, yeah. Where are the bulk of your independent dates? Is that in the Northeast? Is it Ohio? Is it the, 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 the New York, Jersey area? It's all over the goddamn place. What are you doing out here in L.A. right now? Uh, out here, I had uh, uh, two shows. Wednesday and Thursday, I had bar wrestling. Uh, Who'd you work with? Uh, uh, do you know Rocky Romero? Yes. Yes. Me and him. Me and him had a very fun match. Uh, that was great. Tonight, I'm going to be working Jeff Cobb at bar wrestling. And then I'm going to be flying out to... New York for Creative Pro, and then from there I'm going to be flying out to Rhode Island for Beyond Wrestling, and then I go back to my nice, big, beautiful house. So the uh, I do know that you're going to be uh, defending your MLW middleweight title October 4th in New York City for MLW, and that is an MLW TV taping. And you can get your tickets at MLWTickets.com, and that's the bottom line. I like work with MLW. Oh, I love it. I mean, the the learning tree there is insane. Well, yeah, because you you're, you're talking with Court, who's got a you know he, he's from the Gary Hart yeah. you know, coaching tree. If we were going to be talking football action, sure. So obviously, I think his television uh, vision uh, is kind of a 
born from a lot of things, but obviously huge WWE experience as he was a former writer there. So uh, is there any difference in working with that organization versus like uh, some of the, like the Leo Rush match I saw you work, uh, Sammy Callahan match I saw you work? I mean, what are, what are, what are people as an, in, as an independent wrestler, what are these different people telling you as far as how they want their TV produced and how that pertains to how you're working? I mean, these people normally leave me to my own devices, but I will say with MLW, it's more hands-on because this is a TV product. So I need to, I can't be going in there 25 minutes doing whatever the hell I want. You know, they, you have to have your times. You have your times and they, they give you direct directions of what they want to see. And who am I to argue with guys like Bruce Pritchard? Guys, uh, I don't know if you uh, remember him, uh, Alex Greenfield. He was uh, on yep. the writer's team, WWE. Uh, Rob was another guy who was on the writer's team with WWE. I love him. Uh, I, I mean, everyone there is just an absolute insane wealth of knowledge. And when me and Bruce aren't bully uh, bullying each other, uh, uh, sometimes they'll tell me some really cool stories, and it's great to pick his brain, man. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's a back and forth thing. It's like, you know, not that, that he's always, hey, yeah, you, you got to do this. It's It's... It's, uh, dude, it's, it's a process. Oh, yeah. It's communication. And the, the thing, uh, I've talked about this with Court. One of the things I loved about Bruce when he's working with me on my segments, man, it's like, you ain't afraid to go out there, you know, and you can't be afraid to, you know, push the envelope or go out on a limb. And that's one of the things that, as far as the creative wills of Bruce Pritchard, you know, I mean, he can be overbearing. I mean, he, you know, he's, he's Bruce. I mean, and I, man, I loved this gimmick when he was brother love. I was riding down the road with Dr. Tom in uh, Tennessee, and I didn't know that they were brothers. You didn't? No. Wow. No, well, they don't look the same, especially when he's yeah. all painted up red. Sure. And Tom was up down in USWA, and we were struggling to pay our hotel bill. And Bruce is in New York being brother love. Yep. And I didn't know he's on a writing process or part of the writing team. And they all, we all grew up on the same shit. Houston wrestling from a Sam Houston Coliseum, Paul Bosch promotion. And Tom looks at me one time and he goes, what do you think about Brother Love? And this is right when it kind of started effing with Brother Love and started kind of jacking him a little bit and it kind of toned him down. Mm. And I said, no, I said, dude, I said, I used to love that guy. But then they kind of just started watering him down a little bit and it was a shoot. That's what they had done. And, but then he goes, that's my brother. I said, oh, you're kidding me. I said, no, but at least I, get, I gave him my honest opinion. But yep. Bruce and me were, were together right there before the end, man, right there at, uh, in 2003 when I wrestled uh, The Rock in 19. And that was going to be my last match in Seattle. And hardly anybody knew that. But, man, my nervous system was shot. But all, all the things were kind of happening at that time. And, and Bruce was a guy that really helped me backstage as far as those creative segments, trying to, you know, keep keep the machine rolling mm. and working with stuff. So, yeah, he's got to bounce ideas off oh, of. Yeah. I, I like messing around with old man Bruce. Good dude. Hey, man, when you are, are riding down the road uh, with a person of your caliber, I mean, will you just ride with anybody? I mean, because a lot of times back in our days, in the territory days, we're riding together because ain't nobody making no money. Or if you are making money, it's a big-ass party. But then when you get to the big show in New York, I mean, that's when you start traveling by yourself because you can afford it and you want the privacy and you want the downtime. But when we were riding together, man, in Tennessee, Atlanta, or whatever, riding with Harley Race, Leon, uh, Bronco Lubitsch, Skandar Akbar, I mean, I'm, they're dropping knowledge on me. But if, we're, if it's the boys, we're booking the territory. I mean, who's on top? Who should get the belt? All this guys and shit. I mean, it's all in fun. Sure. But it's, it's part of a shoot, too. So you traveling. I mean, I how mean, are you a, working at? A lot of it is flights. So Yeah, because the indie scene is a little bit different. You can't just all congregate yep. and get there. Um, but... Uh, the the earlier stages of my career, which is funny to say because I've only been doing this three years, but I loved those long drives because that's when I would get to pick the veterans' brains. That's when I would get to ask questions and learn and soak in knowledge. When I was on these long car rides with guys that I had mentioned earlier, like Alex Reynolds, Johnny Silver, VSK, uh, Bull James, I'd pick his brain uh, early on. Tell Bull I said hi. Absolutely. I had him on the show a year or two ago. Good dude. Yes. I wish he would have got a better uh, run over in WWE. Sure, sure. Yeah, good, yep. good, good dude, good worker. Yes. Hello, um, Bull. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, and uh, God dang, uh, before you keep going there, Gregory Iron told me to tell you you're a bitch when you see him. So from Gregory Iron, he says you're a bitch. 
The thing is, he got to say that because he, he can't slap me because of the whole thing going on with his... Uh, Damn. You know, I'm just, hey, man. One. I'm just Lord. calling it like I sees it. Hey, man, Gregory Iron called me the other day. He's a good kid. I Another guy talking to him. brain I pick, honestly. Oh, yeah, I love Gregory. He was on the show, and we had so much fun talking over here, and we shut the microphones and kept talking. And then uh, he's supposed to come back on the show when he gets back to L.A., and he leaves me this damn three-minute scathing promo on my damn voice message. I said, boy, you little son of a bitch. <laughs> so, so I got a bone to pick with you, Gregory. I, I call him Gregory Irons. He says, Steve, it's Gregory Irons. No, motherfucker, it's Gregory <laughs> Irons if I want it to be. Yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that when you come back to 317 Gimmick Street and open up a can of whoop ass on you little chump ass. Because he could took the window and he could took the stairs and you could probably throw him to a wall if you want. He weighs like what a, a buck oh five. Max, let's just say I threw him through the window. That window has since been replaced, obviously, because it's brand new material. But yeah, it's yeah nice. I threw him okay. right through that son of a bitch. And my, and my wife had just windexed the whole son of a bitch. So yeah, I old Gregory up. <laughs> Gregory, hello, you sorry bastard. Come back on the podcast. Anyway, so back to it. Uh, what is your ultimate goal? Because I've heard you say on promos, and I can imagine this is a shoot, that you want to be the greatest professional wrestler that ever lived. Absolutely. I want to be remembered as the guy that everyone would go home after they went to a show, or they'd be in bed after watching me on TV, and they'd lay their head on the pillow, and all they think to themselves is, God damn it, I hate that piece of shit. That's all I want. I don't want anything more than that. I don't want anything less than that. I want to be remembered as as... Just someone who was goddamn really good at making people mad. Real mad. You want to know why? Because I love making people mad. It is my favorite pastime. And and also back to the guys who like really took the time and mentored me, like Hawkins, Pat, uh, you know, Sammy Callahan. He took a lot of yeah. time with me. I just want to be able to take all these dudes who invested time and effort into me and give it back tenfold just by being the goddamn best. And right now it's going pretty good. It's going, it's going, I don't want to say it's going better than I thought it would because come on, but it's going good. It's going good. I would be remiss to ask if WWE was on the radar or uh, you'd like to end up there it is, get there. It's absolutely the ultimate goal. Right now at the age of 22, uh, I am making a living off of this and I am, I am, I'm building um, not only just my brand, but I'm also building myself bell to bell. I'm building myself when that red light's on and I want to keep doing it. I want to make sure that when I go there, it is the best version, which is hard to believe that it's going to get better, but it is. It's the best version of MJF possible. So right now I'm going to keep doing these top tier indies I'm, and, and I'm going to keep making my rounds and keep doing these loops. And uh, yeah, the, the end goal, the ultimate goal is to work there. But I still, I want to see these other places. I, I want to check out the ROHs, the Impacts, the New Japans, uh, the PWGs. I want to be able to say I've done it all because I look up to guys like Jericho and Eddie and Benoit. Like I, I want to be able to say I did it all before I went to my dream job because I want to be able to be the most polished guy possible. So when I do come in, I'm not coming in knocking. I'm coming in breaking the goddamn door down and letting everybody know who the hell Maxwell Jacob Friedman is. You know, it's an interesting story because, you know, when Randy Macho Man Savage went to WWF, you know, he had been around, you know, on the damn territory yep. for quite some time. And he, he always had the gimmick. But, you know, when all of a sudden Vince got his hands on him, well, here's the dude. First of all, he had the premier gimmick, premier promo, premier work. All of a sudden, all Vince got to do is strap the rocket on his back, and they were making money. Easy money. And, and, and Savage was huge. So, I mean, yeah, he came, and by the time he got there, he was ready. When you say, uh, or as close as you're in the independent scene, uh, recently, the who was all those guys that sold out all in? I guess it was in Chicago. Yes. Were you there? Yeah, it was uh, the opening. I was the opening match for the pay per view. It was me versus Matt Cross. What? Oh, dude, man, yeah. Matt Cross was so talented. He was on tough enough uh, when I was there. He didn't show us yet. He was I, waiting for his moment. I gotta ask, what happened there? Because that is a guy that I feel they missed the boat on. 
I mean, freak athlete. Oh, dude, freak athlete. But uh, like he said, you know, he was waiting on his moment. Mm. And, uh, you know, Tr- Trish, you know, kind of said, man, you know, and he was. He, he yeah. wasn't showing out at the level that he that he could have or should have. And we've remained friends because I really like Matt. And I love the work that he was doing with Lucha Underground. Sure. And I'm glad that, that he went there. And I'm glad that Eva Lee went there. I'm glad that Martin Casals went there. I'm, I'm glad I wanted everybody to be successful there. And it's like I told those kids, well, we're doing tough enough. I mean, because that show was, it was damn near shoot mm. i didn't have no script they didn't have no uh just written here's what we're doing i would walk up to eric van wagon and and i'd say hey man what are we doing he goes well steve you're gonna go out there and they're training them to do this and then you just go do your thing so i would go do my thing and then when it came for an elimination you know it was elimination but you know matt was just like he said he was waiting for his moment and maybe from you know that that veteran side of him he was being respectful when he should have just really put out but mm-hmm. man i'm i'm so proud of that guy and happy for him that he's achieved all the all the success and the business that he's been able to to get into so how was that? Because that had been exciting. Because I was never in the indie scene. Because I was one of the last. Uh, uh, I was one of the last territory guys. Mm. So that had to be exciting for a bunch of guys to come together and to sell out that venue. The the bottom line is Cody Rhodes. Uh, he, he changed my life legitimately. Because we're a lot of people on the independent scene aware of my work. Absolutely, we're a lot of people fans of my work. Absolutely. But All In was a completely different stage, completely different level. We're talking about everyone who's anyone in our industry is watching that. And and, and they're watching it intensely. Um, and the fact that I got to make history and be the opening match is insane. The fact that the Young Bucks and Cody Rhodes gave me that opportunity is insane. And I'm uh, honestly forever indebted to those three guys. You know, Cody, Cody uh, he just, he even said he saw a little bit of himself at a younger age and me. Which already means a lot because that's another guy whose who's stuff I watch all the time um, and look up to. And the fact that he gave me that opportunity, I knew I was ready and I proved I was ready. But uh, I, I didn't know that somebody would go out of their way to do it. And he did. And he might not be, I might not be one of his best friends, but he's one of my best friends, whether he likes it or not. Like, it meant the world to me. It really did. And it was one of the... It, it really was. It was the best night of my life because what we do is so DIY and we're building our own brand. We don't have this big machine behind us. And the fact that when my music hit, 11,000 plus people knew to boo. They knew. They knew it was up. And, and I was ready to make them boo even harder it was a crazy moment for me. How was the energy of that crowd from start to finish? Because I heard it was pretty insane. It was nuts, man. It was Isn't it great nuts. to be in front of a crowd like that? Oh, God, yeah. Because the small buildings, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, well, as long as there's people in them, yeah. can be so intimate and so fun because of the atmosphere. I remember, and I'm sure maybe you've not been in these same situations. Well, you've probably been in a couple of National Guards, but hell, we'd wrestle at the damn Chevrolet dealership there in Dallas, Texas. Man, I'd be taking suplexes on the parking lot. For the <laughs> and, uh, and I'm thinking, man, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Hey, I'm a pro wrestler. I'm a pro wrestler, but yeah. I'm also thinking shit this ain't what i saw on tv sure you know so when you get those hot crowds it's just magic and when you're going out there and they're buying everything you're doing that's a good day at the office i mean and i don't i really genuinely and and based off the people i got to talk to when i went to the back which was cool ddp was there and 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 he grabbed me and he was like god damn kid so that was a great moment tully blanchard who i've watched his matches till my eyes have bled said he enjoyed it and it was it was just a really cool moment because I, I deep down, I knew it was good, but obviously as performers, we look up to these people and we want the validation. We want to know what they thought. And and I got it over tenfold. And the best moment for me, hands down was when I got a text from Cody and he just wrote point blank period, you delivered period. And I, I was after that, I was like, hell yeah, man. And he went on the JR's podcast and he said, if there's an all in two, and MJF's available, and he's he's not in New York. <laughs> we'll we'll take him. So, and that's cool because that means that the the young bucks are obviously cool the two. And they, I didn't have much interaction with them, but right before I went out there, they were so cool, man. Matt and Nick walked up to me. They were like, "Go out there, kill it," and I was like, "Yeah." I got you. Like, I'm, I'm ready to go, man. And I was. You brought up those na- names, and I know, man, when Cody left WWE, I was like, man, I understood why he was leaving. I could understand the frustration, but leaving there, you know, I think his wife was employed there, too, at, at the same time. So, you know, it's a double paycheck, but, you know, man, he's not... 
he's not happy with the direction things are going. He's disgruntled. He knows that he can do better. So he says, you know, I'm going to go yeah. prove myself. And he has. And man, like I've been watching and, and I stay in touch with him. And I saw him over in Long Beach uh, a year ago and they came out here and worked. And he worked with uh, whoever it was, the Japanese guy who was a champion, Okada maybe. Anyway, uh, so he has really done well on on, on, uh, on that scene. My question to you, with as much uh, of a character as you are, and I, I love your work, could you fit in a New Japan style? I think so. I think New Japan right now could use a guy like me. Um, I feel like I'd be different, and I feel like different makes money. Unique makes money. If everybody is wrestling, acting, cutting promos the same exact style, no one's standing out. Not to say that that's the case. I mean, New Japan has by far one of the best locker rooms I, th I think point blank period. I feel New Agreed. Japan's locker rooms, it's absolutely insane. But I feel I would be able to bring something different if I went over there, just like I feel I'd be able to bring something different if I went anywhere. And here's the thing about Japan. When I went over there for the first time in uh, WCW, you know, it was like we went out there, and of the crew that was over there, it was myself, Arn Anderson, Ron Simmons, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit. There's a couple of guys that I'm, I'm, I'm leaving off. Oh, uh, damn big dude. I forget his name. Nord, dude, arm wrestling guy, Scott Norton. Sure. Scott Norton was there. Anyway, all of a sudden, you go out there and you're either watching Malenko and Benoit or Benoit Guerrero or whatever, either one of those three, and then you've got to follow that. It's like, because I'd been in the business at that point in three years, give or take. Crazy. I was still, you know, I was pretty good mechanically, yeah. but all of a sudden, you're, you're like watching all this, and because I really wasn't a character, I was like, okay, I'm a, I'm a worker. I'm that mechanic. I'm aggressive, but then uh, when you watch those guys as polished as they were, you're thinking, well, how do you follow that? Mm -hmm. And my answer to this, because I learned by trial by fire and experience, you just follow it, but you do your own shit. Yep. Because if you're going to try to do Guerrero shit, Benoit shit, or Malenko shit, and that's not what you do, that's not in your wheelhouse, those guys' ability blew me out of the water. Yep. What in my wheelhouse? You got to go out there. I got to be I got to be me. I got to go out there and be aggressive. I got to do my shit. So, yeah, as long as you do you, yeah, you'll stand out. But, yeah, why would you all of a sudden turn into the whirly gig yeah. guy and da, 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 when that is not who you are? Be true to yourself, and, yeah, you'll be fine. Absolutely not. And can I do all that stuff? Absolutely. Do I break it out sometimes? Absolutely. But I'm myself at the end of the day, and I, and I just dial myself up big time and I feel like that's where I can fit in any locker room and if really we're talking about those three guys we're talking about Cody Matt and Nick I feel like whatever they decide to do next if you are capable of following them if you are capable of trying to reach what they're doing you'd be an idiot you'd be a fool to to turn the other cheek and go the other way I feel and they're starting to, they're starting a revolution they really are it's crazy Wrestling in 2018 right now, it's, it almost seems limitless. Hey, man, before we sign off, I want to be able to drop your social media information so people can find you, follow you, and be involved with the MJF lifestyle. Absolutely. If you want to follow somebody who's absolutely better than you and maybe can take some tips, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore MJF. Well, on that note, man, it was good talking with you and good meeting you. Uh, I've enjoyed watching you work three years in the business. Hell of a future ahead of you. Uh, it was good to meet you. Yeah. Look, Steve, I wish I could say the same thing, okay? But this house is brutal. I mean, what is this, like one step up from a trailer park? And also, buddy, while I kind of respect what you've done in this industry, let's, let's get facts straight here. I don't need you to give me notes, okay? I think you and I both know that I'm better than you. All right, let me, tell, let me cut you off right there because you couldn't lace my boots. You're lucky to be in the same damn room with me, much less for you and me getting a goddamn squared circle. So you couldn't lace my boots now. In 15 years, you ain't going to be able to lace my boots. And we'll see where you are in 15 years if you can cover half for what I did in my illustrious career, you little pile of shit. What'd you just say to me? I said, I'm Is calling that, you a pile yeah? of shit. You're going to talk to me you like that, you know pal? I was listening to you all damn yeah? podcast long, but you know, right now you're starting to wear on me. You can take the window, you can take the stairs, but you need to go. I'd like to see you make a move, old man. How about that? Oh, so now you're calling me old. Yeah, huh? Those yeah. 22 Sprat been in the business three years. Oh, and now you think you're going to fuck with Stone Cold Steve Austin in his own crib. What are you going to do about it? I think it's a good time for you to leave before I do do something about it. Oh, buddy, first of all, if you touch me, I will slap a lawsuit on you so, so big you're gonna your head will spin. You yeah, can't just go yeah, old buddy. school. You oh, don't just step no, outside. No, 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 no. See, I'm not old school, okay, pal? I'm new school. I'm the future. So if you think for one second you're going to tell me when, where, or how I'm going to leave this place, you're out of your goddamn mind, okay, Q-Ball? I'm staying right here. Yeah, I'm staying I'm gonna, right here. I'm going to count it down from three. 
three. I'm going to give you three seconds. Oh, really? Oh, right really, now. Steven? Yeah. Okay. Three, two, two, one. one. You son of a bitch. Yeah. God damn it. How's that? Water in the face, bud. Hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. Oh, God. Bullshit! Son of a bitch, throw water on my ass! You little bastard! I don't know when your Uber's coming back to get you! You ain't never coming back on the Steve Austin show no more, you little disrespectful pile of shit! I give this son of a bitch an hour and 25 minutes of my lifetime, a global icon and a national treasure on the Steve Austin show, a platform to elevate himself, and he wants to throw water in my face? Eh, eh. Mother of here, you sorry son of a bitch. I should have never had your ass over here. I'm out. Hey, this is Jordan Harbinger. I used to host the Art of Charm podcast, but now it's time for something new. The Jordan Harbinger Show. Did you know you can be entertained and actually get a boost in your life at the same time? On this show, we dig into the superpowers of the world's most interesting thinkers and top talents. Then we deliver them to you right into your ears. But I get it. We're not all superheroes. That's why we give you their blueprint so you can live what you listen. After a thousand interviews, learning five languages, and getting arrested in a country that doesn't even exist anymore, I'm now more ready than ever to introduce you to The Jordan Harbinger Show. Listen free to The Jordan Harbinger Show, available on Apple Podcasts, PodcastOne.com, and the Podcast One app. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cues. I'm going to wrap up this podcast and ride off in the sunset. But before I can ride off in the sunset, i got to clean up the mess that Maxwell Jacob Friedman, sometimes known as MJF, up here at 317 Gimmick Street. That's sorry. I will watch the language because this is a family-friendly show. I realized when I left the podcast, I was a little heated. Probably my producer, Sean, had to bleep some things out. I'll tell you what. Maxwell Jacob Friedman is a very talented professional wrestler. Only three years in the business. He's operating at a very high level. But he has a long, long way to go with respect to how you treat a global icon and a national treasure. I do not know if I will ever have MJF on the podcast or again or not. And that depends on if he ever has the guts to come back to my territory. That's the Los Angeles territory, and that's the bottom line. I know he's doing a lot of business out here, but when you come through these city limits, if you lost your L.A. privileges, just like Pulp Fiction when Marcellus Wallace was talking to Bruce Willis's character, you lost your L.A. privileges, MJF. You crossed the line. You went too far. You little arrogant... I'm going to stop right there because I'm not going to demean you. Anybody that wants to book this young man, he is a heat-seeking missile, and he has a ton of heat with me, and that's the bottom line. Although I got doused with water, it was a pleasure talking to one of the bright stars on the independent scene, and that's all I have to say about that. Nothing but the best to you, safe travels, and full houses. That's the bottom line. Hey, man, I've been meaning to update my ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Austin line. Broken Skull Ranch stuff with some Nevada designs and have failed to do so. I'm on the case. All that stuff that's on there now is a little bit old, and we're trying to update the designs. Anyway, what I can talk about is the best damn IPA on planet Earth. Beer. My beer. Broken Skull IPA from El Segundo Brewing Company in El Segundo, four miles from LAX. If you come to L.A. and if you got business, take a left at the airport, go down to the brewery, and get some straight out of the tap. This is the best beer in the United States. It can be found right here at my back door in Los Angeles at El Segundo. If you're at the damn grocery stores, try out Whole Foods and Total Wines. Probably sold out. If you ain't in Cali, you probably shit out of luck. And I've been using my Broken Skull pocket knife more than ever. Cutting ropes, cutting boxes, cutting trash, that's what I use them for. And if I get put in harm's way, I got to protect myself. Everyone needs a pocket knife. End of story. I got two badass knives from Cold Steel, the Broken Skull Knife and the Working Man's Knife. And you get them both at my new Amazon store. Amazon has the best price on both knives. Just go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Steve Austin or go directly to the Cold Steel Knives website and check out their vast inventory of badass sharp objects. 
I want to say one more thank you to all the fine sponsors of the Steve Austin Show, especially CBS, Timberland Pro, True Car, Geico, and DDP Yoga. That's how I'm able to do this podcast for you twice a week for free. Please support them because they support us. If you need more info on my sponsors, check out the show description to this episode for details. Folks, I'm on social media, Twitter and Instagram. At Steve Austin BSR. If you see a fake, spot a fake, give me a heads up at questions at steveaustinshow.com or on my Twitter account. I can't stand a sorry ass punk that tries to copy me and act like an imposter. I will not stand for it and we will cancel them. End of story. Folks, I hope you enjoyed my podcast with Maxwell Jacob Friedman. It's a breath of fresh air to talk to a bright shining star inside the squared circle. Folks, until next time. No, let me talk about next time. My guest coming up this week is PCO, one of the hottest guys on the indie scene, bar none. It's a guy that has reinvented himself. Make sure you tune in. It's a two-part podcast, PCO, coming this Thursday and next Thursday to the Unleashed Show. Until then, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. <clears throat> me, me, me. Yum, yum, yum. Spicy, spicy, spicy buffalo. Tangy, tangy, tangy barbecue. Honey, 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 honey mustard. These Chicken McNuggets have range. Get six pieces made from 100% white meat, no artificial preservatives, and a whole lot of flavor. All for just $2 on the one two three dollars menu. Find a little joy every day at McDonald's. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Trump and Kushner's clearance. I'm Tim McGuire with an AP Newsman. At the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee gives the Trump administration until Monday voluntarily turn over documents related to how White House security clearances. That action follows reports about how President Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner got his clearance. Last month, the New York Times asked Trump if he pushed for it. I know that there was issues back and forth uh, about security for, uh, for numerous people, actually, but I don't want to get involved.